So I would like to welcome everyone today in person and online to Deep Dish Dialogues. We're so excited to have you here. And I can't wait to see what we dive into in the next hour with our event looking at meat and butchery. We're joined today by Brian Schmieler from Valerix Market and Gino Gensante from the Meat Sciences Laboratory. I'm Rebecca Gordon, and I am the manager of the Anita Stewart Memorial Food Lab. So here, and part of my role, and like the, the big highlight, is that I get to put on these monthly Deep Dish Dialogues events. And I'm, I'm actually really excited about this one focusing on meat because putting it together, I learned a lot. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what you pick up and learn from. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that our event here today is taking place in the Nita Stewart Memorial Food Lab at the University of Guelph. And it resides on the lands of the Atawandran people and the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And when we do land acknowledgements and we think about the land that, that we reside on and we think about our history here in this place, we always like to reflect on the fact that we're part of the Dish With One Spoon Covenant. And so that was a pre-colonial agreement where we want to really think about all the natural resources that are on, on our lands that we use. And we want to make sure that we are sharing them appropriately and only taking what we need. So when we're diving into our discussion today, we're going to be talking a little bit about sustainability, the future of, of meat, and also learning different things. But we want to keep in mind that we want to think about how are we using our resources and, and using them respectfully. So without further ado, I'd like to again introduce our speakers and guests today. So uh, Gino Gensante is, as I said, the manager of the Meat Sciences Lab at the University of Guelph. I actually only just learned about this lab uh, a very short time ago, and it's, it's fascinated me. Um, it's been here for um, almost, I think, since 1965, yeah. and they're doing some really cool stuff. So, Gina, how about you share a little bit about the lab and about your role and, and your background? So, yeah, to Rebecca's point, I uh, manage the meat lab over at the uh, meat science building there, and... Um, it's, it's a unique facility in that it is a federally registered facility. It's HACCP. Uh, uh, we have a HACCP plan in place as well. It's the only university in Canada that has a federally registered licensed meat plant, which makes us unique in that we can work with people right across the country. We don't have to worry about provincial borders uh, or anything like that. We can work with people around the world. If we want to send samples, if we want to send finished product anywhere, we can. We have that ability. Uh, that's what that federal license gives us. It also gives our researchers a, an avenue to work with researchers from other universities around the world and not have to worry about how do I get my samples. So instead of them sending a little, you know, 500 gram package, we can send the whole thing, you know, um, without having to worry. Uh, outside of that, we are doing a lot of work. We've recently just started working with uh, Meat and Poultry Ontario which is an avenue for us to kind of open ourselves up to industry and work with industry in terms of what can we do with meat, what can we do with the equipment, uh, working with equipment suppliers to give them a, a venue where they can show off their equipment and still make a viable product rather than in the back of a warehouse where you can't really, you know, taste that product after the fact. So there's a lot going on in the meat lab, and we hope to keep pushing forward on, on those objectives. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. And then, so we've got Brian here. So Brian is the owner of Valerius Market and Butcher Shop. And I have always heard Brian's name get brought up in different conversations around the food community in Guelph. Everyone seems to, to always work with him or want to work with him. And um, so I'm excited now that we have him in here. Um, and how about you tell us a little bit then about your background, Valerius Market, a little sure. bit of everything, so we okay, can fill yeah. everyone in. All right, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, do you know? Great to meet you. <clears throat> um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I uh, I'll tell a bit about Valerius Market. Um, Valerius Market started as a, a market on Alice Street uh, in around 1910, and it operated as a local. Uh, Community market, community store, sort of a one-shop service to that uh, area on Alice Street. And it was a store, butcher shop, uh, until uh, 1990. So it ran on that location for 80 years. And so my 
former business partner, Larry Valeriot, was a nephew of the owner of Alice Street. He reopened under uh, the same name at his present location at uh, Yorkshire and Suffolk. That's where we are now. And that was in 2010. He opened under that. Uh, he opened Valeriot's at that location there. And then I joined him in 2012. Um, um, <clears throat> so my background, I come from a, a culinary background, uh, working in restaurants as a, in, all through high school, um, hotels, small restaurants. I was educated at the Stratford Chef School. Um, and from there, I spent the majority of my career uh, working at a local catering company in Guelph uh, for uh, over 13 years. And so once I, once I sort of finished with my catering career, um, I just live around the corner from the Valeriates Market now. And I got talking to Larry, and, and we, uh, he decided that, you know, a culinary background mixed with sort of what he's doing on the, the butcher end of things and the small little community market, he said that that combination would work well. So I started on at Valerius in 2012, and Larry and I developed, you know, what we're doing today over that seven years into sort of a, sort of a small community service uh, butcher shop, grocery, and then sort of catering and food, you know, you know, cooking, home meals, stuff like that. So we combined, you know, the butcher world, the chef world, and uh, that's, that's where we are today, and we're still doing that today. So it's, uh, <clears throat> it, it's been working very well, for sure. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it definitely has, yeah, yeah. Uh, with your reputation and... Just everything that you have going on. Yeah, good. So um, I just want to let everyone know that we will have a, a period for questions towards the end. Um, so if anyone is online, you're welcome to put your questions into the chat. And then for those who are in person, just you just hold them to the end. And um, without further ado, I'm actually just going to step off stage and let Gino and Brian take it away from here because I know they've got a lot that they want to share. All right. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Rebecca. Yep. All right. So what are we making today? Well... Walk us through this. Yeah, well, today I decided um, to do two demonstrations. Um, probably two of our most popular items that we, we offer at the store. Um, <clears throat> the, first, uh, the first demonstration I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be uh, putting together our, my version of the tr traditional porchetta. So I've taken, you know, the historical porchetta, you know, uh, originated in Rome, Central Italy, whole hogs, uh, stuffed, seasoned, roasted whole. Um, but for me in the store, we don't have that space. Because that's what I was expecting, but okay, yeah, yeah. we'll go on with something so, else. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to think of a way to do it, uh, you know, with, our, with the space that I have and also, you know, where I can merchandise it. You know, I can't just put a, you know, whole hog in my counter. Yeah. It's just, it's just. Uh, no, I get it. So I get it. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through sort of how I've developed, you know, our store friendly for Cat. Cool. So I got some stuff here. Get out of your way. So we start with the I start with a piece of belly. Pork so, belly. Yep, yeah, pork belly. And it's sausage. Um, safety. Uh, we typically wear a cutting glove, and I'm sure you guys So yeah, in uh, your, in a plant in, environment, yeah. yeah, it's more than just a cutting glove, aprons, body. Yeah. Body, body armor, yeah. if you will. Wrists. Um, wrists are covered. So, yeah, a uh, bit more going on. Yeah, a bit more. Yeah, so for me, I mean, we're, we're not doing as, as much cutting as you guys are. Like, we're, we're cutting periodically through the day, so we just find, you know. And this just helps with, um, you know, a lot of the little nicks and things. Oh, yes. That will just be a real pain. Trust me. And then every so often, you know, they'll, they'll stop a good one, right? Yeah. So, um, I'm just going to uh, 
So now what brought you kind of over to this side of the business? Well, like as, a, as, a, as a chef, as a culinary guy, to yeah. get kind of into the butcher shop side of the business. Well, when I first started, I think, uh, when I was a teenager in, in a hotel kitchen, I think my very first job outside of washing dishes was to cube up some stew beef. It was my very first job that a stew chef gave to me and came along and said, here, this is how you do it. And from there, I'm like, well, this is, this is fun. So I went out and bought a steel, <laughs> I bought a bony knife, you know, 16, 17 yep. years old. And I always, never, I always had that memory, and I never forgot it. And so throughout my whole career and, and everything I saw in, in the culinary world, I uh, always gravitated towards, you know, the meat side. processing the meat as, yeah. as much as you do in a, in a kitchen setting. Right, and then, and then after, <clears throat> after uh, I got through the culinary, or when I started thinking more about the butcher side of things, I wanted to learn a lot more, you know, as far as like a small sort of showcase, sort of boutique kind of butcher shop. So, so what are you doing here? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create the outside of the porchetta. So um, we call this we're going to butterfly. Or we're just going to open up, like kind of like opening up a book of the belly. Try not to sort of pierce through it, because this is going to sort of be the, the outside wrap of, Very nice. of, the, of the roast. So again, I mean, it, it, it's not a very technical uh, uh, roast. I mean, you know, if you're adventurous enough, someone could do this at home. Pretty easily, uh, or uh, you know, it's it's a pretty. We're just going through the the layer here. We're just going to try to open up this, so we have a nice canvas to to stuff it. Essentially, we're using this as the outside, and we're going to create different layers. Okay, so if you're doing that at home, what are you kind of looking for in that piece of meat, like? Well, I mean, obviously, um, <clears throat> obviously, freshness is key. Sure. I mean, with with the, with the pork, you know, it's not something that you want that's well aged. You want something fairly fresh, um, not overly fatty. You know, this has a nice balance of fat on the inside, a balance of like meat to fat ratio yeah, yeah. on this belly. There are other breeds of, of pork that have, you know. Well, ideally, I fat. think you want to be looking at about 15 to 20 percent fat. 15 to, yeah, yeah. ideally for, for a pork belly. Yeah, okay. All right. <clears throat> All right, so, what are we doing next? So, <clears throat> what we're going to do next is um, I'm going to add some spices to it. So, the, the classic porchetta um, has this heavily salted, heavily peppered. Um, we also use. Um, uh, some fennel pollen, um, some different aromatic herbs, and what I, from what I've seen and, and read about the porchetta, I was blown away by how much seasoning that they use in the uh, in the process. Well, pork is a fairly bland meat. There's not a lot mm -hmm. of flavor to it, especially the you know uh, the belly. So yep. yeah. I mean, as a kid growing up, my dad would make these quite often. Dad was a butcher. Grandpa was a butcher. So we had a lot of meat going through the house. And uh, we would buy salt by the bag. We'd buy pepper by the, by, by the, you know, mm -hmm. by the pound. And uh, growing up, that's all he used. He used salt, pepper, and chili peppers. Yep. And he would just roll it up. Hmm. Um, sometimes he'd roll in some cold cuts or something just to give it another flavor and whatnot. Right. But... Not everything you got going on here, which I'm looking forward to. Yeah. So, <laughs> but that's how we did it when uh, when I was a kid. Uh, to this day, Dad's 88 years old, still makes his own sausages, still makes his own yeah. capicolos oh, and stuff. Oh, I love that. That's so great. I want to just add that Dad making it is my hands getting dirty. Uh, so he, just yeah, so we're yeah, clear. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's yeah, he's a, he's a good instructor. How's that? <laughs> yeah. So that was some salt, have, you know, a good layer of salt, good layer of pepper. Uh, and that's uh, fennel pollen. Okay. A little fennel seed yep. um, goes into that. Um, and then uh, 
some more aromatic parsley. Um, and you know, a generous amount. You want to really pack it. You want to put quite a lot in there. And then I got some, I got some dill. Dill, dill fennel, you know, traditional, yep. traditional flavorings again of the, of this dish. Uh, a little bit of sage. I'm gonna say, yeah, yeah. Very nice. And again, it's a pretty rustic sort of. Yeah, yeah. You know, I just keep that even. So then. I got to this point when I was thinking about this, this recipe, and I'm like, well, okay, you can't just roll the belly. It's going to need more substance. To right. It. It's going to need more. So I'm thinking, like, you know, in Italy, the whole pig, so you got shoulder meat, you got, you got the hind yep. meat. <clears throat> How can I incorporate that here? I said, well, why don't I make a farce with some shoulder and hind meat? Okay. And, and just like a simple Italian sausage. Like a stuffing. Yeah. Okay. Just like a simple Italian sausage. Mm, yeah. And then use a layer of that. Now, did like, you season it the same way you season the belly? Yep. There's a there's a, just straight salt and pepper again okay. in this layer as right. well. So, <clears throat> so then this will incorporate the uh, this will incorporate that sort of use of the front shoulder yep. and the hind meat. And again, sausage making is is also a big part of our store. Yeah. Uh, we you know we make fresh sausage, you know, twice a week uh, in the summer, and then what kind one, of flavors are you putting out? Um, you know, all sorts. I mean, we do fennel and hot. We do a wine and cheese. Uh, we do chorizo. Oh, okay. Fair so right. it's usually like people come in um, at the beginning of the week and they ask, you know, are you making this sausage this week or or you know, people will come in and request. Yeah. You know, can you make you know hot and honey garlic sausage for me this week? And then, so it's really sort of tailored to the demand of you know yeah. what people want. Now, do you find that the people know what they want, or do you find yourself kind of leading them towards something? They come in with an idea, or they come in with yeah. Hey, Brian, I want to do this. Yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, um, we're fortunate. Like. I would say 70% of our customers are, are repeat, okay. bi-weekly, once a week customers. Oh, nice. They've been shopping at the store, you know, for, for years and years and years. So they, you know, those people know, they know, they know what we do and they, they request, you know, what, what they're used to. But then they also are up for a challenge. Up for something new, something different. You know, something different. Yeah. If they see something different, uh, we can work together on, on, on putting. Of, you okay, know, cool. To get to that, to get to where, where they want. And again, that's sort of the, that's sort of the, you know, that that's sort of the joy of, of having the culinary background, uh, in a butcher shop setting, because then you can you can work, you know, from the cut of meat, what they should be using. Whether it be beef, pork, for to tailor it to get get them the proper cut of meat, the proper for the for, for that. Well, dish. the proper application, right? Yeah. Because certain yeah. cuts cook differently, different ways, and yeah. and people don't realize that. People kind of look at a piece of meat and oh, you can grow this, oh, you can you know, roast this. And yep. Some do better. Yep. Um, and, and that's where you know your local butcher comes into play. Yep. Right yep. Now? And then and then and then using it and and you know. Um, seasoning it and flavoring it and, and this and that. So you combine the culinary, the butcher, and, and it, 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 you know, it works. Makes it, yeah. Yeah. You're, um, you're able to then bring I, the two worlds together more so. Yeah, exactly. And sort of that's what kind of this roast is sort of trying to, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, the, the butcher part, the sausage making, yeah. the belly, the, the pork. You got it all in one. Yeah, you got yeah. it all. Perfect. Um, then I was thinking, well, you know, it's this is a lot of rich, fatty meat, maybe a little sweetness. Yep. So I just roasted some, some apples. Could um, you use raisins? Um, you could. Have you ever you, tried that? No, I haven't tried raisins. No. I'm not. It a, just came to mind, and I thought, yeah. oh, raisins might be good. I'm, I'm not. I'm not a raisin guy. Oh. Uh. So, um, 
Like every time we do butter tarts in the store and someone asks for raisins in their butter tarts. No way. Eh? Yeah, like, <laughs> but then it's not a real butter tart, it's right? Not, Come yeah, on. You need, you need the yeah. raisins on the butter tart. So then um, once we got the apples, I'm like, it still needs more. You know, it's still, like, <laughs> it's not, not it's still, it's not, okay. it still need, needs the next, the not, next level. It's so. only a few inches thick. You've got yeah. more inches to go. So I was like, I've had a lot of porchettas where you have just the, the loin, yeah. center cut loin meat in the middle. Right. And I was always sort of disappointed because that's a really lean cut. Yeah. It's, and it dries out so fast. So you get to the middle part and, 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 and it, it's just, it could be moister. Right. So I'm like, okay, well, why don't I take a piece of the capicola from the, from the shoulder and why don't I pre-braise that for a good four hours and get it fork tender. Right. So I tried that. So um, I pre-braised a couple pieces here. And that's your center. And that's going to be the, the center of the roast like that. There's like meat wrapped on meat wrapped meat, on meat. meat. Just yeah. layered, yeah. Okay. You know. Um, and then, so I figured, okay, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, you think? You think? Yeah. Right. So Larry and I were like, okay, this, you know, we, Larry and I worked on this together for, for a couple of different barbecue competitions. And oh, okay. We finally got to this point where, okay, to me, as a chef, it makes sense because I think by the time... This center reaches the proper internal temperature, right? Through and through. Then the sausage meat's going to be cooked perfectly. Mm -hmm. Yep. The belly is going to be on the outside. It's going to take most of the heat, but it can. It can, and especially and, with the skin on. And the skin, gonna... skin on. So I said, you know what? It's probably going to, it's probably going to work. So, um, and it did. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to. I'm going to just roll it, yeah. and I'm going to fold that belly flap over to one side, that belly flap over to the other. You need a hand with anything? Yeah, right. that's kind of good. Okay. Yeah. So you talk about your customers. Where do you get your products from? So um, being in Ontario where we are, uh, of course... Um, I, lo I, I locally source um, all my pork, like super local, uh, all within, you know, half an hour drive of, of the okay. store, um, uh, as well as chicken, uh, all my lamb, uh, and then a, a lot of my beef um, is local as well. Okay. But I also, I also um, support beef from all over Canada. Personally, um, there's a great beef program on P Prince Edward Island that I really like to, to purchase, you know, um, some Atlantic beef, which is, which is a little bit different than the Ontario beef. Um, and a then, certain breed you're looking um, at? Or? If you breed, if you feed, yeah. uh, you know, their environment. Okay. You know, um, and, then, and then the Alberta beef, you know, the, the, the great, you know, Prairie the raised, great Canadian beef. You know, great Canadian beef. That's yeah. prairie raised. Um, Be you know, careful. We're in Ontario, and the Ontario beef farmers, yeah. you know, could be watching. Yeah, and, no, know. I know. So let's but, say nice things about them. Too. Oh, yeah. But, right. you know, like, um, uh, so I sort of just, you know, support all of Canadian beef. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's all, uh, I mean, it's best beef in the world as, as you know Canadian beef as we like to say so um, oh, that's a fact right it's, yeah 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 don't tell the Brazilians no but. yeah or the yeah <laughs> so um, now we're gonna tie this this roast um, and again you know I mean for me tying uh, it creates sort of two purposes. Um, so sort of the butcher meat end of things, um, you know, it adds for the presentation, uh, keeps everything neat and tidy, good look in the counter, yep. you know, um, lots of uniformity. And then the culinary uh, side of me 
It's like we, you know, we learn to tie um, as chefs uh, to make sure that um, to make sure that everything is even. Yeah. So everything cooks cooks even. evenly. So it all cooks uniformly. Yeah. So there's there's sort of both both sort of ideas there. Yeah, you um, want to kind of eliminate that tapered end and go try and square it off so it cooks more yeah. evenly to your point. You don't have that burnt end. Yeah, you don't have like, you know, part of the part of the roast is well done. Part of the roast is, you know, it's still rare. So yeah. it sort of pulls everything together. Yeah. Yeah. And there's I mean, there's a million different ways. I've seen a million different butcher's knots. I've seen oh, a yeah. butcher's knot. Different... You can use mesh. Yeah. There's there's mesh as well that mesh can be used. Tubes and... um, I've seen even steel cages yeah. where you can to hold that together. Hold it all together. Yeah. Um, like coming from industry. So I mean you're doing it in a butcher shop and you know, I came out of after thirty years in processing plants. Yeah. Um, yeah, they do it a little differently in the processing plants. It's but okay. they don't do it as detailed either. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's going from feeding the masses to, you know, feeding the individual. Uh, that's the difference between processing plants and the local butcher shop. Butcher shop. And I mean, a little bit about knives and equipment. Yeah. You know, I, I just sort of use sort of what, you know, I've sort of gotten accustomed to sort of a longer, yeah. more flexible uh, carbon, you know, so it hones, stays sharp yeah. all the time. Um, and I find like the, the old vintage. You uh, like the old blade? Carbon steel is, you know, they, they just don't make them like they do anymore. No. Um, and then. I'm sure somebody's asking, but what kind of handle is that on that knife? Yeah, this is a deer antler handle. I've just, <laughs> it's just been, a, I've had it for pretty much my whole, whole career and. And I brought it into the butcher shop years ago, and I was like, wow, this stays sharp. And that's the only, that's certainly, you know, the, the, the actual carbon steel on the blade is, is old and super high quality. Oh, no, so, it looks it. So, um, and then, you know, like a stiffer, stiffer boning knife. Yeah. I'll use that in my next uh, demonstration. And then a big scimitar, for, you know, for steaks. Yeah. Cutting out big roasts. Cutting through the big roasts. And that's sort of the, the knives that I, I sort of stick with. But there's all kinds of, you know. And I don't know what what do you guys use in, like, It depends what we're doing. Um, we use the bandsaw a lot when we're cutting steaks. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of that that goes on. Um, it's it's a lot of sawing. Okay. Uh, at the industrial level or mm -hmm. in, the, in the business world. Um, again, if, if we're doing specialized orders and whatnot, yeah, then it's outcome the knives and okay. whatnot. But in industry, what you find is um, a lot of it is actually frozen pieces that they run through a bandsaw, right? So they'll freeze a loin or they'll freeze, you know, a, yeah. a roast and then cut out your steaks. So you get a bit more consistency on that end. Right. Right. So that's one of the differences uh, between the butcher shop and the uh, local processor. And, and the processing, yeah. yeah. Now, one thing that we struggle with in processing is waste. Um, mm -hmm. we, you know, it, it's it's one of the ongoing struggles in, yeah. in industry is how do you reduce it, eliminate it, um, and 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 in industry we look at different things. Mm -hmm. You know, what can you can you utilize? And that's one of the things the Meat Lab does is work with people on ideas on how to reduce waste, how to utilize parts. One of the projects we're looking at is uh, using uh, beef hides, much like a pork rind. So turning beef hides into a pork rind uh, that seems to be big in a lot of places in the world. Um, we'll see how it goes. But again, it's, it's something you have to look at to experience. All right. So now what do you got going there? So this is the finished roast. Um, so when we merchandise it in the butcher shop, we would... You know, we would we would merchandise it sort of, you know, displayed like that Very in nice. the meat counter. And you got your belly. Yep. You got your herbs. You got your sausage meat, and you got your pre braised shoulder. 
And like um, cooking wise, uh, a piece that size, uh, 350 degree oven, uh, approximately two hours. Okay. And that's it. So pretty yeah. quick. Yeah, yeah. Pretty quick, easy, simple roast. Take it home, drop it in. Yeah, of course. Would, would you? Know, you something yeah, you don't even size, have to season course. it. Yeah. That's yeah, all seasoned, ready to go. Yeah. Just goes right in the oven. And I have a few in the oven here that will. Oh. Will taste. Excellent. We'll I was going to say this looks good. Imagine when it's cooked. We'll taste all it right. a little bit later. No, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. So that's that's the porchetta that, that we do up down at the store and um, yeah it's uh, it's a pretty popular item very nice I could yeah. see why yeah. I may have to pop by and grab some yeah. all right or maybe we can trade you can come by and you know we'll see what we can do for each other yeah yeah that's, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah, that's good yeah. and then you said you had something else to make yeah so uh, I'm gonna shift from pork um, to beef okay yeah so we have uh, just gonna move that out of the way. This guy. Save him for later. Yeah. You want that? Yeah. I'll just need that for sure. Perfect. <clears throat> so we're getting. All right. Now let's give us a description on this piece. So, um, let's that up there. Sausage. sausage meat. How's that? Look? Not bad. Not bad. So now, if you were to let's talk about grading. We're talking about beef now. Yeah. You bought that. What grade was that? Um, so this is a, this is what they call a swinging rib. Um, so this is, this is how the, the, the whole prime rib, uh, seven bone piece. Yep. Um, this is how I would buy it, uh, with the long bones still attached, uh, with the, with the outside cap. Still on. Still on. Um, and then for... This marble grading, I would I would give it a double to triple A grade. Okay. Um, and again, um, when we're looking at uh, beef grading, um, what you want to look at is the percentage of internal marbling inside yeah. the muscle. So a single A grade would have, you know, lightly speckled internal fat. Yep. And then. As it becomes more intense, the little fat lines in there, you know, double A, triple yeah. A, and then in Canada, our scale sort of tops out as Canadian prime. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the Australian, the Japanese have, you know, their Wagyu programs. Their Wagyu programs, yes. And that's just sort of a more intense fat to yeah. meat ratio. Yeah. So. Um, this piece here, uh, this comes from Mill Grove, which is just down the road, um, and it's a it's a black Angus, nice. um, and this is uh, dry aged for uh, 21 days. Okay. Uh, and what the dry aging does, the dry aging process, it um, sort of just pulls water out. Okay. So it pulls water out and just intensifies the flavor. Uh, in the flesh, in the fat. Yep. Um, there's many things, like a couple different applications we can do with the long bone um, uh, swinging rib. Um, we can cut the bones off here, and you have your 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 classic prime rib. Yep. Prime rib roast. Prime rib roast. Yep. Um, we can we can bone it right out. So when you're left with a boneless piece. Um, boneless rib roast, yep. or you can go down and, and cut into your ribeye steaks, right? So, and then what I'm going to do today um, is I'm going to do one of our most popular summer offerings that we do is a long bone, uh, uh, French long bone rib steak. Okay. So 
you know, a lot of people just like to have the big, the big giant, the big giant showcase yeah. and the ribeye on the bone. Exactly. Um, so I'm just gonna put this back on again. Yeah. And just to talk about that, I mean, yeah. we've all seen them in the store. They're gorgeous, you know, big hunk of meat on the end of a baseball bat, and yeah, yeah. you know, you could see that on the grill, kind of being tossed back and forth. Mm -hmm. All right. And I appreciate and I love it if somebody like invites me over for one of those, but I don't want to buy the bone. Yep. Right. Well, it is. It, it is. It's, it's been. It's been a sort of a sort of a marketing uh, showpiece. Right. Oh yeah. No. It, it, again, it looks it, gorgeous. It's, it's the guy you know who's got everything and yeah. wants the two you know yeah. three big steaks and. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, the Flintstone steak. We need yeah, that. The Flintstone steak. <laughs> you know, you don't. It's not necessary, but. Um, it looks good. Yeah. Presentation. Uh, you yeah. know, people talk about like you know real estate. It's location with with food. It's all about presentation. Yeah. Um, and and you can't just slop it on a plate. No. So there's just a bit of the. Uh, so yeah, just walk us through what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, I'm there. just gonna bone out sort of a bit of this back rib here. So now you're going to take that all that cover fat off, or no? Nope, I'm just going to stop there. Okay. So now, for us in the shop, um, all these scrap pieces like this, um, they get they get another life. So okay, yeah, like so like with with this trim here, these bones would would go in to a roasting pan. They'd be roasted, turned into a, a bone broth or into a, a a beef stock. So really it reduces, we're talking waste reduction here. Yeah. You yeah. know, use up everything you can. Yeah, like we're pretty much at the store now. We're pretty much food zero waste. Oh, excellent. So, That's good to hear. So what we, what we can do with all of our trim is like all the fat can go into, uh, into a tallow. Yeah. We can render the fat. Yeah. Um, we can, we, you know, a lot of people just want to buy the fat. That's right. Keep the fat for grind sausage meat or whatever. Yep. Stuff like that. Like, you know, being a small store like we are, you know, we have the control and and the space to be able to, you know, process. Yeah. Until until there's nothing know, left. Until there's nothing left. Yeah. And industry industry, I will say, struggles with that. Um, mm -hmm. We do have renderers that take a lot of our product and turn it into edible oils and yeah. and you know perfumes and things like that. But right. there's still a fair amount of waste that is generated yeah. out of a plant. And, you know, how do you deal with that? Um, so looking at different opportunities, as I said earlier, is, is our biggest goal. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that's a nice size chunk. Yeah, so that's just, I'm going to separate one bone. Right. So not to take business away from you, but if somebody were to buy that whole roast, they mm -hmm. could do this at home? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I strongly recommend. Oh, for sure. The tools a, a, mesh, are a mesh glove for, yeah. for the home. But if you wanted to buy one of these pieces, we we could we could walk you through. Excellent. Exactly, sort of. And, you know, a lot, a lot of people do. They try. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people come in and want, like, a whole pork shoulder and... Do it all themselves, or oh, a right. ram's shoulder, or yeah. or like that. So, again, this is where your stay ribeye steak would come from. I'm gonna further uh, trim this down. All oh, this is we call this cap fat. Yeah. So this would go into burgers and you know. That's your juiciness. Tallow stuff like that. That's your juiciness. You can see where the ribeye is yeah. starting to take shape here. Still on the bone. Yep. Put that there. Now looking at that. Yeah. That's not a meal for one. No. No. Okay. No. Just so I'm clear. This is two. Yeah. Two. Two to two to four. I usually recommend, you know, one bone. Two people? Uh, two people. 
okay. with leftovers, you know. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you're eating quality, you don't need as much. You know, I like that. Right? <laughs> you know? When you're eating quality. Like you know, it's it's you, high quality. Yeah. It's great flavor. It's rich. You know? See, so you bring up when you're eating quality, it fills you up. I heard somebody saying that people tend to reduce their quality in order to increase their quantity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Do you believe in that? Um, yeah. I mean, I can understand... Um, you know, if you're feeding a, a family and you're feeding multiple people, then you know, um, you, you know, you're not going to bring this home. Yeah, a lot of people don't. Have, <laughs> a lot of people don't have the have the the luxury if if you're you know at that stage of life. But um, you know, it, it is expensive. You know, beef is expensive. Uh, pork is expensive. Uh, yeah, meat you know, meat in general over the last few yeah. years has really shot up. Have you seen a difference in shopping habits in terms of, you know, somebody would normally come in for a six or seven pound roast is now coming in for a three or four pound roast? Yeah, yeah. Right. A lot of shopping habits have changed, definitely. And, um, um, you know, we, we have to adjust to on our end and, and offer, you know, the, the lower ticket items. You right. Know, we offer the full... The full, you know, like like chicken thigh meat and you know pork sirloins, right? Sort of secondary, secondary cuts of yeah. lamb and beef that you know aren't as expensive, but with the proper preparation, seasoning and prepping, yeah, yeah. the proper yeah. the proper cooking methods. Yeah, you can take some. Something like a flank steak that's typically tough and yeah. seasoned and cooked properly can turn it into a nice yeah. piece of meat. Yeah, marinate it. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> yeah, the versatility of meat, I think, is is not talked about enough in terms of what you can do with it. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in the meat world, it's, it's, all, it's all about time and temperature. Um, you know, you got the, the long and slow cook when you got those tougher pieces of meat to break down the fibers and the fats and what not? Yeah. All right. You got your fast fries where, you know, two, two minutes on each side and, and you're good to go. So, yeah, no, it's a very versatile product. It's just getting the knowledge out there to people. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, we're just French in the bone here. It's uh, a little aggressive, but, you know. Good thing it's not fighting back. Yeah. yeah. I like to keep it, you know, I like to clean it right off again. Very nice. So, um, I think we see a lot of things Frenched. Yeah. And well, you saw, like, lamb. Mm -hmm. The crown, lamb racks. Crown roasts. Crown roasts. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I was trying to remember, I think I read or in my studies in chef school that, uh, I'm not sure if it was in the sort of Victorian era, uh, where... Um, it was proper, proper table etiquette to eat meat from the bone. Yeah. Well, it so was proper I, etiquette to use your fingers. To use your fingers, but to eat, so, and I guess that's why they they started Frenching bones like this. We'll just get rid of the clean, and you know, there's a lot of people that would want to eat that. Oh, just like that, just yeah. Just like that, yeah. Drumstick. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that's a good little drumstick. That's a nice little drumstick. Yeah. So Not that's that far off. Yeah. <laughs> that is nice. That is a nice. Yeah. So that's the that's the long bone, rib steak. So now, how would you recommend cooking something like that? Um, this guy here. I mean. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a roast. It's a roast size. Right. So, you know, steak size would be. Would be half of that. Okay. So in the kitchen, we refer we refer to a piece of meat that size as a, as a roast. Right. So your cooking methods will be roasting. You know, uh, if you're you know half of that, then, then you're, you're steak. So you're into grilling and right. different fast uh, fast cooking methods. But this guy here, you'd sear, seasoned with salt and pepper. Uh, you'd sear on either side. 
then you'd roast them at a high heat. Yeah. You know, 375, 400 degrees. About up what? in that area, probably an hour, maybe yeah. hour and twenty minutes or so. That's sort of how we would cook that 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 rib steak. Very nice. Yeah. Very um, nice. Is this also a um, yeah, and that's uh, that's the rib steak there. So now, by that prepared, take it home, yep. drop some salt and pepper on it. Yeah. Sear it for a couple minutes on each side. Yep. And pop it in the oven. Yeah. And, and then it. you can watch TV while this is doing. Yeah. Excellent. Just don't forget. Just don't forget about it. Though. No, no, no. Yeah. They, they got those yeah. timer things. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. And then um, we can probably we can further bone this out, and then we can cut a couple of uh, ribeye steaks. Oh, as okay. Well. So we'll just zip this guy off the bone. Now that'll make some nice beef stock. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, we go through a lot of stock in the store for soup. and So again, this will all be, you know. Soup stock. Yep. Excellent. It'll all be saved. Yep. <clears throat> and then. Yeah, there's not much you can't save when you're. No. You know, everything will be cooked down or. Yeah. Or, you know, used as flavoring somewhere else, or, you know, to your point, you use meat to stuff your, your roast. Yeah. So. So we want to get to a square product again. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, this could be a boneless rib roast, as is. Yeah. And then we can go into steak, boneless ribeye steak cutting. That. Do you sharpen your own knives? I way? do, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Because that's, that's another biggie. Like, yeah. you want to have a sharp knife. Yeah. Um, like as, as tools, as far as tools go, uh, I, think, I think the edge you keep on a knife, especially in a retail environment, is going to make a huge difference. Yeah. And it'll also save your wrists. Yeah. You know, you know 10 plus years of, of steak cutting, the easier, uh, you know, the, the sharper it is, the easier. Yeah. Um, Oh, no, that's just an invitation to Carpal Tunnel. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> uh, and that's one of the things. Like, there, There's a lot of repetitive when you're working in this industry. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to be careful. you got to be smart with how you do things, change it up, change up the routines, and definitely make sure you have the right tools to do it. Yeah. And we're just, you know, uh, again, shaping your classic ribeye style. Very you don't nice. want a little bit of fat, but not, you know, I think I heard industry standards about a quarter inch. Yeah, quarter depending, inch fat. depending what you're buying, yep. you know. Yeah. Um, but then again, it's always the saying, right? The fat, the flavors in the fat. Yeah. So you got to have some there. Yeah. And, you know, we're, this is sort of what our, Sort of part of the butcher industry is this is exactly this is the show. Well, I think I think this when when people think of yeah. a butcher, they'll think of this before they think of the roast. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this is you know compared to what you guys do, this is sort of the end. Yeah, that's that's the, the culmination of, the, of us. Yeah, and then it goes off somewhere and gets uh, yeah. better processed, yeah. further processed. Yeah, let's say. Yeah, you know? yeah, we we put the. We we put the the bells and whistles on it. Yeah, you guys make it all happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the one thing about our industry. It's 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 two sided, in the sense that you have the the processing side and you have the slaughter side. And uh, you know the slaughter side is kind of the ugly side of the world. Nobody really wants to talk about. It's kind of hidden away. But without it, you don't get to this, right? And uh, it's it's. Too bad in a way. And, and, and really, it's suffering overall. Like, I don't know about you, but trying, like, the industry is, is struggling with labor, uh, is struggling with costs, is struggling with the environment, is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they're really taking a beating on a lot of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how much you're feeling see, that you're in. And see, for me, we're, we're the opposite. Um, I have more people calling me 
asking to learn them. Yeah. Right? Well, I think we've been glorified a bit. It's that whole that, sexy butcher thing, right? That, yeah, yeah. You know, it's that small little, yeah. and, and so. You're missing the, the, the yeah, mustache, like, but otherwise. Like this is just the end of the line. People want to, you know, come and work with me and learn how to do this and yeah. that. And, you know, um, it, I guess the culinary world went through that 10 years ago for a long time, all the cooking shows. That's right. Everyone wanted to be a chef. Everybody wanted to be a chef. Now I'm finding that a lot of, I mean, a lot of people want to, start off learning like this, but I'm like, well, you got to start where you are, or you got to start, you know, as a dishwasher yeah. in a kitchen. <laughs> that's right, that's right. To get to... You can't just walk up to the counter and start yeah. cutting yeah. steaks like that, yeah. Yeah. right? So. And, and, and and again, in, in, in our world, in the processing world, it, it's, it's hard to bring people in because who wants to work in a damp, cold, dirty, smelly environment all the time? And make as much as you know the guy down the road is doing a lot less. Um, so yeah, the, the meat world has some catching up to do, but it's also kind of forced the meat world to look more at technology. So the slaughterhouse of yesterday compared to the slaughterhouse of today is uh, a lot different. Today's a lot cleaner, a lot of robotics involved, um, fewer and fewer people. Uh, there's plants where you know. That used to operate on a thousand people are now operating on a few hundred, just because of technology and, and um, automation. So, and, and you know you're forced to kind of go that way because you can't get the labor to do it. So there's a lot of automation coming in the meat world. Um, I don't know if you're seeing it down at your end, but we're seeing it. And that's again going back to the meat lab earlier. It's it's an opportunity for us to give an environment for people to try different pieces of automation, right? right? That's, that's um, and what that does, or hopefully what that does, is drive down the processing costs, which eventually lead to less costs at your end, right? Yeah. yeah and our, I mean, <clears throat> my situation with the store is bringing back the old world, right? Combining, you know, your world and then bringing it back to just a local neighborhood. Yeah. And creating a little local neighborhood store uh, where it's, it's fresh weekly, that's daily. Right. People come, they shop as they need, sort of daily, or maybe every other couple of days. So, now, I know in Europe, that's a big thing. In Europe, people shop daily, they get their yeah. meals. In Canada, it's, it's more of a weekly, big time shopping. Yeah. What do you find you're seeing more of? Um, it's, it's interesting because the younger generation, uh, we have a lot of you know, early 20 year olds and students and you know, young families that are really starting to shop sort of as they need. Okay. Right. Every couple of days. Right. Right. The the older generations, you know, those are the people that we'll see once a week, and they'll buy a, a lot. So yeah, they'll come in with their so, meal plan for the yeah, week, and it's, it's encouraging like, for me to see that the next generation coming up, um, shopping often and just buying what they need. Then, therefore, I can order what I need. That's right. So I don't need to really carry a, a very vast inventory with a high potential of waste. It reduces your waste. It, yeah, yeah. We, can just, we can just monitor it a lot easier in, in our small little area and just service those you know, people as, as they need. So nice. I, I hope that it, uh, you know, that, it, uh, that, it, that continues and grows. Again, it's, it's, it's the way in Europe and we yeah. tend to follow that lead. So, yeah. Um, yeah. but no, uh, I'd rather buy a fresh piece of meat than take something home and put it in the freezer. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah. so it's not going to change price in a week. So yeah, and of course, you know, quality is, is you know. Yeah, the freezing does break down. Yeah. some of it. Um, yeah. We could, we can argue that it doesn't, but free once you take it away from its its fresh state, you're always going to degrade it in some form. Yeah. So yeah, eat fresh, folks. Eat fresh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. That's great. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah, we're good. All right. Questions. Yeah. Who's got a question? Oh, way back. What is dry cure? Dry cure. What is the process of it? Dry curing to be uh, dry aging. Dry aging. Sorry. Dry aging. Um, yeah. So um, typically, that swinging rib that, that you saw earlier, the whole piece, or any you know, any part of the the the, uh, the cow, um, it's a humidity controlled, temperature controlled uh, environment. 
temperatures about is warm yeah. and cooler? Yeah, no, it's the same. It's cold. It's like just above one, you know, zero degrees Celsius. And I can't remember the exact humidity off the top of my head. Um, but then it's just allowed to age open, not in the, the plastic seal. And so uh, it just creates like its own pellicle and the moisture in the water just sort of over time just evaporates out of the meat over, you know, uh, you, can, you can dry age things up to 30 days, to 60 days, and all you're doing is sort of just condensing, losing moisture, condensing flavor, condensing fat to flesh. So it's, it's just less water, um, <clears throat> but also then less yield, right? Yeah. So you lose a lot of weight. Uh, so for me, I have to be careful how far I age something. You know, because it can get to an unreachable price pretty quickly, uh, especially with prime cuts of meat. Um, yeah, so, and it's, you know, it, it gets to an acquired taste as well. Really dark, you've probably seen really dark purple, black steaks, and that's, you know, that, that's an acquired taste. It's, it's rich, it's, it's a little different than, than your, you know, your for, you know, a couple of weeks or so. Oh, <laughs> there you go. So I have a question from the online audience. Okay. So it's actually from Paul Stewart. Okay. And <laughs> you might know him. <laughs> but he is wondering, he knows that you went and you cooked in New York City at the James Beard House. And he's wondering if you remember what you cooked and if you could share that with us. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks, thanks Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that way I went to James Beard House with your mother uh, on the maiden voyage to the Beard House. And my dish uh, that night was I was part of the hors d'oeuvre crew that we did an hors d'oeuvre service. And I cured a pork belly and poached that pork belly in duck fat, I believe, for, uh, for quite a while. Um, and then served it on a bannock. A little fry bread, yeah, yeah, yeah. piece of bannock. Nice. Yeah. And, uh, you wouldn't have to have any. <laughs> <laughs> that, Sounds that's, good. That's, Sounds that, good. That was my dish for that for that event. So. Great. That's great. So I am cognizant of the, the time. Yeah. We have about five minutes left. Oh, okay. okay. Um, is there, did you want to show the final yeah. product, Brian? You, or? you want to see the final product? <laughs> I, don't know about them. I don't know about them, but yeah, I'm kind of interested. Okay. Because I'm thinking, I'm thinking the raw product looks pretty good. So, <laughs> so maybe while uh, while Brian's getting ready, I I have a question for you, Gino. Oh. What do you think the future of meat is going to hold, or what is one thing that maybe <sighs> maybe you'd like to see change in the future? Um, I think I touched on it earlier. Oh, those look amazing. Um, it's it's really coming down to how do we get it done. It's it's a labor uh, issue in the meat world. Um, from the standpoint of, you know, you still have a large population of meat eaters in the world. Like, we're cutting down on our red meats. Um, we all are. We all look at it that way. But I think, you know, you got to look at the industry as a whole and say you're still trying to supply meat to a large portion of the population. Mm -hmm. You can't get people to do it. So what do you do? And this is where I think automation is going to just continue to grow and grow and grow. Um, you know, there's no more, there's no more hand stuffers. There's no more, um, you know, people, lines full of people. It's automatic palletizers. It's automatic saws. It's automatic scales. Everything just kind of runs down a line and gets kind of shifted as it's going across, all measured by sensors. And that's kind of where I see it going more and more and more. Um, places like ours where it's kind of still the, the rustic culinary, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we do it all by hand, you see everything, uh, those are going away. Those mm -hmm. are going away. And that's, that's one of the struggles in Canada because it's taken away from the small, uh, the small mom and pop abattoirs, if you will, who, who service the local farmers. And local farmers are going to struggle more and more as we go forward, right? Because they don't have any place to get their product to market. Right, and that's kind of where we try mm -hmm. to help out. But yeah, my concern is 
you just don't have the labor to do it, and it's going to go to automation, mm -hmm. which initially will drive the cost up, but in time will bring mm -hmm. the cost back down. And that's a that's an issue we're seeing across the board in the, in any anywhere with, in the food industry. Yeah. So. Exactly. Uh, definitely something that we're going to have to tackle to be able to continue to feed yeah. ourselves. Exactly. And I'll, I'll let you um, explain what, yeah. what, we, what we got here. It smells so good, and, and the finished product is amazing. But go right ahead, Brian. Yeah, so the, you know, 350-degree oven, two hours about this guy took. And, you know, your pork belly is going to be super crispy, tender. And then your herbs, your sausage meat, and then your pork shoulder inside will be this. Yeah. Will just be tender as it gets. So it I'll looks just, amazing. I'll just wash up and <laughs> <laughs> cut you a piece. That's great. So while uh, while Brian is is doing that, and we'll have the final little little show there for everyone, I just want to let you know that um, Deep Dish Dialogues is a monthly event, and so we have our next one coming up on November seventeenth. And it's exploring food prices with Dr. Simon Samoji, and it should be really interesting. We're going to learn why food prices are rising, what we can do about it, what, what products are good to purchase. Um, so that, that'll be a fun one to look forward to. So you're all welcome to register for that, and we'd love to have you there. And um, it's just always so nice to be able to bring different people together and, and hear different stories and... Um, we're thankful to our partners, Great. the School of Hospitality, Food and Tourism, and the Errol Food Institute. Now we'll just let this speak for itself. <laughs> <laughs> so we can get a little bit, you know, it's sort of just a center of the table kind of roast. Yep. People just sort of pull off what they, they feel like, with a little bit of sausage meat there. The shoulder. See, it's just fork tender. Oh, yeah. If you can't tell, it's just falling apart as he touches it. It's yeah. not even pulling too hard. Yeah. And some of the belly. Yeah. Why don't you try it first, happy. Rebecca? Oh, no. I don't know if I can do this on camera. <laughs> All right, I'll give it a little go. We'll see yeah, what, how we go. This looks absolutely amazing in here. If we pull it right under the camera, maybe you can see it as well at home. But I don't, I don't know if I can do this. Okay, we'll go right in for. <laughs> All right. Mm. It's amazing. <laughs> I can't wait for more people to try it. Super flavorful, flavorful. A little bit hot, but. <laughs> but very good. Yeah, great. Very nice. So, if um, anyone wanted to learn more. They could come to Valeriate's Market, and yep. you you offer this, and yeah, that's that's what we do. I have a <clears throat> a group of chefs in there, including my wife and and my daughter, works with us from time to time, and we have uh, two other trained chefs. So we're all eager to teach and explain to people, and and help them with their, their cooking needs, and then mm -hmm. you know, sell them. That's fantastic. Yeah, the, the service <laughs> that you yeah. provide, as well as as well as the food. Yeah. So I want to say a huge thank you to you, Brian, for joining us today. I again learned a lot. Again, I I know I need to get some better knives. <laughs> I can't wait to to try out these different things. And thank you to you, Gino, as well for joining, sharing your knowledge with us. And um, I'm I'm so thrilled everyone here could join us today. And we'll see you again soon. Have a good afternoon.